Well, good morning, WCAG family and friends. We want to welcome those that are joining us online this morning at WCAG Online. And we especially want to welcome uh, all of our first-time guests with us this morning here uh, in the room. Thank you guys for coming uh, today. We're excited. We also have a, a campus that is meeting right now in Fairview, Montana. And so we're excited about what God's just doing over uh, this Easter season. We are in the middle of our Easter series, which is entitled Unexpected Endings. And uh, today we're going to talk about one of the greatest unexpected endings in all of the Bible, uh, which is the the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. But I want to talk to you guys for just a second about next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to continue our series, Unexpected Ending, and we're actually going to talk about the last unexpected ending in the Bible. And so I'd encourage you, uh, if you are maybe just um, coming on Easter just to come to church and, and do that, I'd encourage you to come back next week as well. A lot of friendly people here learning about Jesus and growing in the Lord. And so uh, we're going to be talking about that next week and finishing up our Easter series on unexpected endings. Hey, I need some participation today from our uh, congregation this morning. Those of you online, you can participate as well. But um, how many in the room have ever prayed before? Could you raise your hand if you've ever prayed? All right. Hey, most of the people in the room ha ha have prayed before. Now, prayer is an amazing thing. Prayer, you don't even have to be religious to pray, do you? You just have to need to be in a bind, right? Like a lot, a lot of times that's where people all of a sudden get religious, right? When you're really in a pinch and you say, man, I have got to, something's got to happen in my life, uh, whatever is happening. But here's the cool thing, guys, is, is prayer uh, is asking someone we do not see for help with something that we cannot handle. Prayer is asking for help from someone who we do not see for something that we cannot handle. And many times our prayers are for God to do something for God to take action in some way. God, I really need some help in this situation. God, would you heal grandma? God, would you give me the job that I just interviewed for so I can make more money? God, could you help me on this test that I'm ill prepared for? How many were like that in school, right? Like it was like, yeah, your prayer life just a whole new level at that point. I failed to study, but man, I'm throwing one north of the border hoping for a, you know, that God's gonna come through. So guys, here, when we see prayer, prayer is we are talking to God and we're saying, God, could you do something because I'm really in a bind right now. And here's the thing, guys, is that many times when God answers those type of prayers, our faith in him actually grows. Like we actually kind of go, wow, this is amazing. God heard my prayer and he came through. Isn't he an amazing God? And so our faith grows. But you know when we really struggle is when God says no. You ever been in one of those situations where God says no? And you're like, oh man, there are so many people, guys, that, that they don't think prayer is supposed to work that way. They're supposed to say, we're the ones you know, it's like a vending machine. We put in the prayers, we press what we want, and it's supposed to come out at the bottom. And when God says no, we really struggle with that. In fact, there are a lot of people whose faith is actually like shipwrecked at that moment when God says no. When God doesn't answer a prayer the certain way that we want him to. And we think that because God says no, he somehow doesn't love us maybe as much as other people, or maybe he's against us in some way because he didn't do the things that I wanted him to do. And God's answer, we think, should always be yes to us. But do you realize, guys, that the reason why we're sitting in this room today is because God said no. That's why we're in this room today, because God said no. In fact, one of the most hidden, unexpected endings in the entire Bible is actually where God says no. I'm gonna show it to you this morning. If you take your Bible this morning, if you have it, if not, it's gonna be on the screen behind us in the New Living Translation. Whatever translation you have is fine. But in Matthew chapter 26, God actually says the most incredible no that absolutely transformed the world in one moment. In Matthew 26, reading at verse 36, we're going to start there, it says, then Jesus, 
went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further, bowed his head to the ground, praying, my father. So he's praying, Jesus is praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. If it's possible, can you take this cup of suffering away from me? Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. Prayer does that to some of us, you know. Like they're supposed to be praying, they're, end up, they're actually sleeping, and then Jesus says to Peter, he says, guys, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you do not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. Then he returned to them again, and he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went and prayed a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, go ahead and sleep, have your rest, but look, the time has come, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going, look, my betrayer is here. Guys, often we think that it is in our best interest that God responds to all of our prayers with yes. But in this passage of scripture here, God saved the world with a no. He saved the world with a no. Guys, I want you to take and pick up your communion cup if you have it this morning. Grab that. I, it was given to you as you came in. If you didn't get one of these, we're going to have somebody just quietly walking around. If you need one, just wave them down. We practice open communion here at WCAG. What that means is uh, if you're a believer in Jesus, we'd love for you to participate if you would like. Um, we don't force anyone to do communion or anything like that, but we just say if you'd like to participate. So those guys will be walking up and down. But guys, it's interesting to me that Jesus used the phrase in his prayer, God, if this cup of suffering could be passed by, I'd really, that would be preferable. But he said, it's not my will, I will do whatever you want to be done. And so we see that right now we hold in our hands the representation of the cup of suffering. That Jesus was like, I, if there's any way, I would love to get out of this. And, and God literally saved the world by answering no to his one and only son. The bread in this little container here, it represents the body of Christ that was wounded for our transgressions. The whipping and the marring on his back that led to ultimately our healing and our freedom. The juice represents the blood that flowed down onto the cross, the sacrifice that cleansed the sins of the world. But here Jesus says, if there's any other way, God, if there's any other way that we could bypass this cup of suffering, if there's any other way we could bypass the cross, God, if there's any other option, could you let this cup pass from me? And God said, no. And with that no, the world was saved. He said no to his one and only son. Why would God say no? Why would God in that moment say no to his one and only son? It's very simple, guys. It's found in the most common passage of scripture in the whole Bible, which is John 3, 16. It says that the God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but ultimately would have eternal life. So this morning, guys, I want us to take the bread and hold it in our hands. So I'd wrap the, tear the cellophane wrapper off and take the piece of bread in your hand. And Jesus, 
took the bread and he held it in his hand and he said this. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. I want you to do this in remembrance of me. So today we remember what Jesus did. He stood in our place. He took the whippings for us. He was the sinless, spotless lamb of God that we could not be. Our lives are full of sin and brokenness, but Jesus was the only one who lived a sinless life and could be the substitution for our sin. So we're gonna thank God for the body, uh, the sinless life that he lived. If you would bow your heads and pray with me. Jesus, we thank you today for the sinless life that you lived because we were unable to do that. We thank you for the stripes that were taken on your back in our place. Let's partake together of the representation of the body of Christ. The Jews here, the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Today we're thankful for the blood that Jesus Christ poured out on the cross that cleanses us from all sin. Let's pray today and thank God for the blood of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross for each one of us. And today, if we accept that free gift of salvation from you, we can be forgiven. Thank you for the gift of salvation that will lead ultimately to eternal life. Be careful as you open the cup here and let's partake together. You can just set that aside for the remainder of the service. Guys, today around the world, millions, literally millions of people are gathering in gatherings just like this to celebrate the greatest unexpected ending that history has ever known. I want you to use your imagination this morning with me, and I want us to walk as if we were one of Jesus' disciples, as if you yourself were one of the 12 that you walked with Jesus, that you sat by campfires with him, that you heard him teach on sandy beaches and on hills throughout that area. Can you imagine for a moment being one of Jesus' disciples on this weekend and what it would have been like yesterday and one of the darkest and most difficult days that you had followed this man for, over th for around three years and you had seen him do absolutely incredible things. You were standing there, you were standing with him when they brought a man on a mat right to, in front of Jesus because the man could not walk. People would carry people in front and they would set him in front of Jesus and Jesus would lay his hands on the man and instantly you would see legs that had never carried or bore the weight of a human being become strong again and they would jump up and you would watch as the man would leap and dance before you saying, it's a miracle, it's a miracle, Jesus healed me. You watched as milky white eyes would stand before Jesus and he would t lay his hand on, on the head of that man and all of a sudden you would see those milky white eyes begin to clear and the person would gasp the words, I can see, I can see. You were there. You were there watching these incredible things. You were there when Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus and the family was absolutely just upset with him that he would show up late for something like this. Jesus, if you would have come when Lazarus was sick, you could have laid your hands on him and he could have been healed. And Jesus stands at the tomb of his friend Lazarus with tears in his eyes, the Bible says. And they open the tomb and he calls into the darkness. He says, Lazarus, come out. And all of a sudden, this man in grave clothes begins to hop out of the darkness. And you were there. You saw it when Jesus did things that no one else did. 
the things in nature that were unexplainable. The one day you were walking past a fig tree and, and he went to get some fruit off the fig tree and it didn't have any, it was all leafed out, but it didn't have any figs. And Jesus cursed the fig tree. The next day you walk past and there was a pile of leaves and just dead limbs everywhere. And you're shocked that even the forces of nature obey this guy that you're hanging out with. You remember the time when you were in the boat and you were afraid that it was gonna capsize and you called out to Jesus to save you and he stood up on the bow of the boat and he stretched out his arms like this and he said, peace, be still. And you watched as the foaming waves turned into sheer glass before your eyes. Then you stood in front of thousands of desperate people listening to the message of Jesus as he taught them hour after hour, day after day, and many of them began to get hungry and we said, Jesus, we gotta send them away. There's no food for many miles. Some of them will faint on the trip if we, don't, if we don't do something. And there's no way that we can feed these people. And Jesus says to you, you feed them. To which Philip responds, he says, Jesus, eight months wage wouldn't even buy everyone a single bite. But yet someone says, hey, there's a kid here with five loaves and two fish. But how far could it go among so many? Jesus says, bring it here, and he laid his hands on them. And you took the five loaves and the two fish, and you began to break them up, but every time you broke them up, they seemed to be the same size, and you continued to pass out all of these things to, to thousands of people. Not only that, but there were 12 baskets left over, one for each of the disciples, so you literally held one of the baskets that was brimming with bread and with fish from leftovers from the absolute miracle. You've seen incredible things. Re remember when... At the beginning of this whole thing, when you first started following Jesus, you were thinking to yourself, who is this guy? Like, I mean, it's not just the miracles, but the teachings, they're so countercultural, they're so different. He speaks as a man with authority, and he's not out to get fame. This isn't about him trying to, to get a big name about all these people. You know who flocks to him? People who are destitute and who are broken, tax collectors prostitutes, people that, that everyone else despises, and these are the people that flock to this man. In fact, even the religious leaders are kind of indifferent. They're divided on what is going on with this guy. Even amongst the 12th, you wonder, could it be that this guy is the Messiah? Maybe he's the one that is here to set God's people free to set Israel free from the Roman government, from under this rule. You watched just days ago, you watched as he came in to Jerusalem on a donkey, on a young colt, and as he was coming in, people began to wave palm branches and they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, laying the palm branches down, taking off their coats and laying them on the ground in front of, of the donkey as Jesus uh, came into the city and they were shouting Hosanna. They were saying, you are the one that can save us. You are the one that can save us. And you go into the city and when you arrive in there, you go and you, you go up to this room area where you're going to have a supper together. And when you get into the room, everyone starts looking around awkwardly because there's no servants in the room. And you know that after a long journey like this, it's customary that before you would eat food that you would wash your feet from the long journey, but there was no servant. That meant that the person in the room who was the least was the one that was supposed to wash everyone else's feet. But as a disciple, you thought to yourself, well, I've got to rank higher than somebody else in the room. So you just stood there with your sandals on your feet until Jesus took off his robe and set it aside and took a towel and wrapped it around his waist and took some water and he began to kneel down and he washed all 12 of the disciples' feet. Do you know whose feet he washed? All the disciples' feet, that's right, amen all the disciples' feet. And you know who is in all of the disciples? The one that would later betray him with a kiss. Jesus washed everyone's feet that night. And after he was done washing all of our feet, 
Then it was time for supper, and Jesus began talking about these things. He said, he said th- you know, he broke the bread. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. I need you to remember this moment. This is really important, guys. And then he took the cup of wine, and he said, this is, this is the blood of the new covenant, and you need to remember this. This is super important, guys. And then he began to talk about how all of us would desert him. In fact, many of us would deny that we even knew him. And I thought to myself, and you thought to yourself, you go, that's impossible, I would never deny this guy. I mean, we've been together for three years, I've seen incredible things, I will stand with him, I will walk with him, even if he is going to his death, I will walk with him, we'll die with you, Jesus. But in the darkness, when the guards came, fear overtook you and you fled into the darkness, running blind. You later heard about the trial that they had, the false trial where they lied about Jesus, and you saw as the crowd that had the opportunity to set Jesus free, they, they had an opportunity, the Roman government said, we find no fault in this man, there's no way that we can accuse him, we have nothing to, we don't want to have anything to do with this guy, and yet the crowd cried out, crucify him, crucify him. But there's another criminal here, his name is Barabbas, Who do you want us to set free? Do you want us to set free your king, or do you want us to set free this criminal, this murderer? They said, give us Barabbas. Crucify him. Crucify Jesus. So they took Jesus, and they began whipping him and flogging him until his back began to look like ribbons of flesh You watched at a distance and saw him attempting to carry his cross, and because of blood loss and absolute exhaustion, he only made it part of the way, and they actually had to grab a guy out of the crowd to finish the job to get the cross up to Golgotha. And when they got to Golgotha, you got within what you felt like was close enough distance, but you were afraid, you you were still afraid that someone might connect you with this Jesus. But even at the distance you were, you heard the screams and the cries as they pounded the nails into his hands and into his feet. And then at the distance you were, you saw them lift the cross. He was unrecognizable your best friend, your savior, the the one you loved, your rabbi, the one you followed all of this time, was hung there on a cross between two criminals. An innocent man, the greatest man you ever knew. And your hopes and your dreams were dying with each breath of this man who hung on the cross. As he hung on the cross, there were times that he would stop and he would lift to fill his lungs enough with breath and he would speak just short sentences, but he said things that you just would blow your mind, things like, God, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. As he hung on the cross in absolute agony, he was actually giving forgiveness to those around him, saying, forgive them, God, because they don't know what they're doing. And then, with his last breath, he uttered three simple words. He said, it is finished. And then he died. They took Jesus and they laid him in a tomb. They sealed it with a signet ring, certifying that he was dead, and then stationed guards around the tomb so that no one could come near that tomb. This was surely an unexpected ending for the disciples. This was, no one saw this coming. This wasn't the way it was supposed to shake out. In fact, you're looking around at the other 12 disciples and you say, where do we go from here, guys? If Jesus is dead, then what's the point? What's the point of all the teachings, of all the miracles, of all the last three years? This was the ending. This was the worst possible ending, and all of your hope hinged on this Jesus guy. The one who did the miracles was now dead. Guys, the reason why Easter is celebrated is not just the cross, but it's because of the unexpected ending at the tomb. 
You see, in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 7, it reads this way. It says, but very early Sunday morning, much like today, the day that we are on right now, very early Sunday morning, the, woman, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothes dazzling, or, or their clothes in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and they bowed their faces to the ground. They, they, then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here, he is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. You see, if Jesus is dead, then it's all for nothing. But if Jesus is alive, that changes everything. That changes everything. If Jesus is alive, that means that when he said, I am the resurrection and the life, he actually meant it. That means that Jesus is actually God. That means that Jesus is actually the Messiah. That means that Jesus, if he's alive, he can still do miracles. That means that Jesus, if he's alive, then he can still transform and change people's life. See, Jesus was not only part of the greatest unexpected ending in history, but if Jesus is alive, then he can step into your story and bring an unexpected ending as well. You see, Easter, guys, is, is notorious for uh, people coming to church out of religious obligation, maybe, or out of duty. A lot of people come to church on Easter. I mean, it's an American culture. It's what we do on Easter, right? But I don't believe this morning that anyone showed up in this room by accident, or that someone is listening online by accident. I believe that God has been drawing people to himself in a powerful way. I think there are people sitting in this room that even you can look back at the last few years and you can sense that God is trying to do something in your life. And today may even be a pinnacle point of that moment that God has been trying to get your attention. He has been drawing you he has been trying to get you to come to a place where you come to the realization that you are in desperate need of a savior. And maybe you're here this morning and you got dressed up for Easter on the outside, everything looks really nice and everything is going well. Everybody thinks that it's going well, but secretly you're struggling. The mountains in your life, there are things that need to be moved. There are things that need to change. You might be here this morning and secretly you're struggling with depression or you're struggling with anger or you're struggling with addiction or you're struggling with brokenness and you need a miracle. You might be here, you need a miracle of physical healing. You might need a, a miracle of, of uh, healing of your heart in some way. You might be dealing with mental instability. Maybe you're here this morning and you struggle with panic attacks or anxiety. You might be running from God, living a lifestyle that deep inside your heart you know is not right, but yet you're doing it anyway in the opposite way that you know that God wants you to live. But this is the cool part. If Jesus is alive, he can change all that. You can walk away from this service this morning, your life completely changed through the power of Jesus Christ. Now, I wanna be careful here. This doesn't mean that everything, all the struggles, you're still gonna have struggles, you're gonna have difficult times, but here's the beautiful part, is that you won't have to walk through those struggles alone. That Jesus is alive and he wants to walk with you. And he wants to walk through those challenging moments together that today could be the unexpected ending that you have been waiting for. All Jesus did on this earth, every single person he comes in contact with, he changes their life incredibly. People who were walking this direction, leading lives this way, when they, their life was intersected by Jesus, God turned it around. And it turned and went the other direction. You know what, maybe you're here this morning 
and you just come to the realization even today that maybe you're searching for forgiveness deep inside. Maybe you can't forgive yourself for some of the things that you've done, but guys, I want you to understand that if Jesus is alive, then he can change everything, that he can bring the forgiveness that you are looking for, he can bring the transformation that you are desperately needing. What we have to understand is that the disciples, when Jesus was placed in the tomb, hope died with him. But when Jesus rose from the grave, hope rose with him as well. So this morning, this is how we're gonna land the plane today here. I'm gonna have the worship team come at this time and if they could prepare as we're tying things up. As this morning, we're going to be um, we're gonna be singing a song together to close the service, but this is not like just a normal ending song or it's kind of like the benediction and that's it. This is actually part of the message. I really felt like even six months ago that this song was supposed to be played on Easter for us here at WCAG, that God wanted to do something and this song is entitled, God Turn It Around. And it talks about how God can break through. Breakthrough can come in the name of Jesus that in the name of Jesus, everything changes, it says. It talks about God healing people. It talks about God saving people. But you know what it talks about? It says God is healing someone. God is saving someone. God is doing something right now. You see, it's not just about somewhere, maybe God will do something. Hopefully, well, maybe God is a God of the past, or maybe God is the God of the future. Guys, here's the thing. The Bible says that salvation is for today. Today is the day of salvation. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, today. Basically, God is saying, right now. Right now. So this is what we're gonna do this morning, guys. In just a moment, I'm gonna have you guys stand. I'm gonna ask you this morning to allow the words of this song to just pour over your soul today. And if you're in this room and you need a touch from Jesus in a powerful way, whether that's physical, whether that's emotional, whether that's spiritual, or any other category that you can come up with. Jesus wants to step into that situation that you're in right now. The living Savior, Jesus Christ. So what we're going to do, I'm going to come back in just a moment, but we're going to sing this song, and I'd encourage you, maybe it's a newer song, so some of you might not know it, but I would just encourage you to allow the words to begin to speak to your heart today. And allow Jesus in these moments, maybe you'll be here and you just want to close your eyes and allow uh, the song to begin to speak to you, but I believe that God wants to step into your situation wherever you have found yourself at. Here's the thing, guys. God wants to meet you right where you're at today. He wants to meet you right where you're at today. He loves you that much. He loves you so much that he literally said no to his son, that his son said if there's any other way, God. But you know what else the Bible says about that moment? That in Hebrews, it explains to us that it's talking about Jesus, and it says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. But what that meant was that Jesus could look beyond the cross, and he could literally see this moment here in Watford City, North Dakota. He could see this moment as we gathered together, and he looked at it, and he smiled, and he said, even though I will have to walk through the suffering of this moment, a smile came across his face. He says, because it's going to make a big difference for them. And for thousands of years now, People's lives have been transformed by God's no. And this morning, guys, if you're here today and you just need a touch from God, I would encourage you to reach out to God in this moment as our worship team sings, and then I'm going to come up for just another two minutes. I just want to share something with you guys this morning. But let's just, I'd encourage you to stand this morning as we just allow God to speak to our hearts today.
Maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but I believe that God is drawing you even in this moment. I'm gonna ask you if you would be willing to surrender your life to Jesus. Maybe you're here in this room and at one time you did serve Jesus Christ, but you found yourself heading in the wrong direction. And we've been praying this morning that God would turn it around. Maybe you're here this morning and you would say, you know what? I've never felt like, I never felt worthy enough for God to love me. Oh man. God said the greatest no of the universe for you. That he literally allowed his one and only son to die on the cross because he loved you that much. So this morning right now, we just want to take a moment and sometimes we do different things at, at, during this time of the service, but if you're here this morning, I'm just going to ask you if you found yourself in a place where you, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ or you found yourself far away from God, but you just really want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, we're going to pray prayer this morning. 
I'm just going to ask everyone to bow your heads, close your eyes, and you don't have to say anything out loud. Sometimes we have you repeat things or raise your hand or different things like that. This morning, I just felt like this is what we're supposed to do, that we were just going to take a moment to allow those that have never surrendered their life to Jesus. And even as the song said, God is healing someone. God is saving someone right now. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior today, as we're just bowing our heads and closing our eyes, I'd encourage you to just repeat this prayer in your heart with me right now. It might say something like this, Dear Jesus, I know, I know that I'm not living for you, but God, would you come into my life and forgive me of the things that I've done? Would you transform me into the person that you created me to be? Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit today so I could walk in newness of life? God, I accept the free gift of your salvation that was given by Jesus dying on the cross and rising again. And God, I want to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, there's a part of this song, and I'm going to have the worship team play it again. But there's a part in this song that says God is healing someone and God is saving someone right now. And we're going to sing that as a declaration to Jesus today as we're tying things up this morning. It, that just says all of my hope is in the name of Jesus. As we walk from this place today, that we didn't just go through another service, but we literally said, Jesus, my hope moving forward is found completely in you. sing that again, just that God turn it around, but as Pastor Sheldon was speaking, I just felt that really impressed that all of us have maybe gone in a path or a direction that, know, that we know is really a, towards a path of destruction ultimately. It could be addiction, it could be relationship, it could be finance, it could be all these things that cloud our mind and our heart and soul and weigh us. And as we just sing, we just want to sing, God, turn it around. All the congregation, let's just sing this. God, those things in my life, turn them around. The word of God that was spoken rightly to us, let that turn my life around. Let me turn those circumstances, those situations that seem impossible to me, but all things are now possible 
with God. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Sing it again. So God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Let's sing that again. My marriage, my relationships. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Finances, jobs, all these things bring us down. Turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. One more time. God, turn it around. So God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. All of my hope. Cause all of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. Cause all of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. And breakthrough will come. Father, this morning, as we prepare to leave this place, we call upon the name that changes everything. God, turn it around. Whatever's happening, whatever's going on, thank you for the word of God that was spoken into us today. God, and let that turn our attention away from the things that's been pulling us away from you. And now, an about face is made as we steal our face and hearts towards the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the world, our risen King. And we ask all these things in the wonderful, resurrected name of Jesus this morning. Amen and amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful Easter Sunday.